Well, welcome to or welcome back to the 510 Report, where we talk about industry news, advocacy, and general goings on. I have a monster of a topic this week. In fact, it is such a monster of a topic that we're going to be doing the first part today, and then we'll be doing part two next Wednesday in the 510 Report. And before we get into any of this, I have to give a huge shout out and thank you to Miss Danielle Jones. She has been instrumental with the 510 Report, specifically this episode. Danielle, you are a credit to the vape industry and you are the advocate that I aspire to be. So let's get started here. So the vaping community has always regarded big tobacco as public enemy number one. And, you know, for good reason. Cigarettes are on track to kill a billion people by the end of the century. And vaping was born out of a desire to escape that same fate. No one will disagree that big tobacco is responsible responsible for for countless untold deaths but are they really vaping's biggest enemy or is there someone else who stands to lose more if vaping succeeds your doctor the FDA the American Cancer Society almost anyone you ask will tell you the best way to quit smoking is with FDA approved smoking cessation products things like gums and lozenges and patches and pills and inhalers made by big pharmaceutical companies like GlaxoSmithKline Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer but one of the really interesting thing about these products is they have a very low success rate. Researchers at the Harvard School of Medicine studied long-term quit rates and found that these NRTs are no more effective than quitting cold turkey. And another study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association came to the same conclusion. So what then would be Big Pharmaceutical's motivation for continuing to sell ineffective products. Perhaps their priority isn't that you quit smoking, maybe they just want to keep you as a customer. Now we have talked about the master settlement agreement here on the 510 report in the past as well as in the vlog and down in the description I'm going to link to the first truth about vaping episode which I've linked to in the past that really explains the MSA, the master settlement agreement really well. But when that master settlement agreement happened it made public a lot of internal big tobacco documents and memos. In these documents lie deep financial ties between big tobacco and big pharmaceuticals. In 2002, researchers from UCSF published their findings after going through many of these previously secret documents. Now, where do you suppose big tobacco purchases their chemicals and filters and things they need to manufacture cigarettes? Yes, from the same chemical and pharmaceutical companies that create and make quit smoking products. Now, to keep these multi-million million dollar deals intact, the pharmaceutical companies have to keep the tobacco companies happy. One case study from the UCSF findings found communication between a company called Siga Geigy, which is now known as Novartis, and for the sake of this 510 report, I'm just going to refer to them as Novartis moving forward. But they found this communication between Novartis and Philip Morris, which showed that Novartis was a major supplier of pesticides to Philip Morris. But when Novartis released their nicotine patch in 1991, Philip Morris wanted to help them, quote unquote, devise more appropriate advertising. And Novartis artists ended up removing all of the anti-smoking messaging from their marketing of this nicotine patch. Honestly, take a look at any NRT, a gum, patch, lozenge, anything, and you'll notice something really very interesting. They never mention on the packaging that smoking is unhealthy or that smoking is bad for you. Their message on all their packaging is just a very simple if you want to quit smoking, we have the tools to make that easier. And pharma sticks to that script because Big Tobacco has threatened to stop buying chemicals and stop buying filters and stop buying ingredients they need to manufacture tobacco cigarettes if they don't. And the reality is that whether you buy cigarettes or NRT products, or especially if you become ill from a tobacco related illness, you are just a customer of Big Pharma. And the only way that they can lose you is if you quit smoking using a product that wasn't made by them, 
like vaping, or if you drastically reduce your risk of smoking related illnesses. Vaping is a disruptive technology and it has disrupted the big pharma money stream. So you kind of have to ask yourself, like, what wouldn't they do to destroy vaping? All you have to do is follow the money. Big Pharma has money. Big Pharma has lots of money. Big Pharma has more money than people can even imagine. And in order to eliminate vaping as an option for smokers, oh, they spend that money. And they spend that money in a very calculated way. Or I should say, very calculated three ways. They buy science they buy support, and then they buy legislation. And this is gonna sound like a lot of tinfoil hat stuff is about to be said in this video, and I assure you that I have links backing up everything that I'm talking about, and all of those links will be posted down in the description below. And you can read for yourself the corruption. So can big pharmaceuticals really buy science? Well, according to Peter Rost, who was the former vice president of Pfizer, yes. They absolutely do. Peter Rost was also the author of The Whistleblower book, The Confessions of a Healthcare Hitman. He was also going to be featured in a Kickstarter documentary called One More Girl that I'm not sure if it ever actually got made. But in those interviews, he explains the relationship between Big Pharma and science very, very clearly. I'll be linking in the description down below to the full interview. Dr. Peter Rost said, Universe Universities, health organizations, everybody that I've encountered in my former career as a pharmaceutical executive are out there with their hands out. You know, everybody's begging for money. Nobody has any money. The government doesn't have any money. Universities, universities don't have money. Nobody's money. The only ones that have money are these big multinational corporations. And they have lots of money. And they use that money to basically buy influence. And the way it's done is, number one, you give these organizations and institutions grant, grants for various kinds of research. You do uh, develop research together with them. You establish friends. You make sure that they become beholden to you. Um, and you also pay individual professors and doctors and researchers directly. You may pay them as speakers to travel around the country, uh, $1,000, $2,000 per day, sometimes more. Uh, you um, uh, give them money for programs, that the educational programs where they can make a profit, and then they put on these programs. And they're supposed to be third party independent from the company, which is all fine. But as you and I can both imagine, if you have a promotional budget at a corporation, you're probably going to give that money to the universities that do the programs that most support your drug. And the ones that don't or are critical in any shape, way or form, they're not going to get anything. And everybody obviously knows that this is how things work. And, and that means that even if you can officially claim, well, this, we, this is arm's length, we didn't have anything to do with it, we just gave them a grant, they can do whatever they want with it. Reality is, they're not gonna continue to get money unless they're saying what you want them to say. They know it, you know it, it's only maybe the public that doesn't know it. And, and that's how you influence the medical establishment uh, simply with money. Evidence of this influence is pretty easy to find all over the place. For example, $3 million grant was given to the University of California San Francisco School of Medicine from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in 2015. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is a nonprofit created by pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson, the manufacturer of the majority of over-the-counter quit smoking products on the market. The foundation itself is actually one of Johnson & Johnson's shareholders holding upwards of $1 billion in stock. So I feel like it's pretty safe to say that this foundation has a vested interest in the success of Johnson & Johnson and in the success of Johnson & Johnson products. The University of California San Francisco School of Medicine is home to one of the most 
outspoken and ferocious opponents of vaping, Professor Stanton Glantz. And in the description of this grant, it clearly, clearly states that one of its goals is identifying other areas for learning, such as global innovations that increase smoking cessation or new ways to reduce initiation with, for example, e-cigarettes and other emerging nicotine products. I, I just want to go over that one more time. Identifying other areas for learning, such as global innovations that increase smoking cessation or new ways to reduce initiation with, for example, e-cigarettes and other emerging nicotine products. One of Stanton Glantz's main talking points is he believes that vaping is attracting gigantic numbers of kids who would otherwise not ever smoke a cigarette but are initiating nicotine use with e-cigarettes and then going on to smoke traditional cigarettes. And almost exactly a year after receiving this grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the University of California, San Francisco released a study saying that vapor products and e-cigarettes do not help smokers quit. Two years after that, they released another study, this time claiming adolescents who use e-cigarettes are more likely to start smoking within that same year. And the influence continues continues to Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which also received $400,000 in grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for the specific task of studying e-cigarettes. Not super surprising, but the following year, John Hopkins released their study saying that vaping causes irreversible damage to the lungs, it can compromise your immune system, and that vaping has the same dangerous chemicals that are found in traditional cigarettes. And then two years after that, almost on schedule, they released another study saying that vapor liquids contained high levels of toxic metals. It's just such a huge coincidence that these grants that came from Big Pharma to these universities, the conclusions of these studies benefit Big Pharma. Now that's either buying science or another insane coincidence. So what about the CDC? I mean, since 2011, they have been reporting misleading anti-vaping interpretations of the National Youth Tobacco Survey, and if you think an organization as prestigious as the CDC could not be bought, well, then you'd be wrong. The CDC has already been investigated for conflicts of interest and ethics violations related to donations that they received from a pharmaceutical company which makes hepatitis C tests and treatments. And in exchange for these very gracious donations from big pharmaceuticals, the CDC launched a major public health campaign encouraging hepatitis C testing. Even though the science and the validity of the tests was under serious debate. And an article published in the British Medical Journal examined these funding conflicts and they questioned the CDC asking how could the CDC remain objective considering the funding it's received. And the CDC's latest scandal, well, their former director, Dr. Brenda Fitzgerald, was forced to resign after they discovered she had financial ties to not just big tobacco, but big pharmaceuticals as well, creating an enormous conflict of interests. But arguably, one of the most dangerous examples of big pharmaceuticals paying for the science they want comes in the form of three men, Jonathan Samet, Neil Benowitz, and Jack Henningfield. A federal lawsuit in 2014 found that all three men were being paid by Big Pharma while they served as tobacco advisors to the FDA. And Samet himself was the president of this committee called the TP. SAC, which stands for Tobacco Products Scientific Advisory Committee. Samet received grant support from GlaxoSmithKline on at least six occasions. He led the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, which is funded by GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer. And he served on the Pfizer Global Tobacco Advisory Board. And since the 1980s, the second guy, Neil Benowitz, has been a consultant for multiple 
multiple big pharmaceutical companies, including GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer, while he was on the TPSAC committee. Henningfield has also consulted for GlaxoSmithKline and other pharmaceutical companies. He had part ownership of a company developing a new NRT drug, and he testified for GlaxoSmithKline and other lawyers when they were suing big tobacco companies. The federal judge in this case ruled that the conflict of interests were so severe that the men would be removed immediately from their tobacco advisory board at the FDA, and the FDA was banned from using one of their reports they did on menthol cigarettes. The judge stated that the recommendation from these three men must be considered suspect and untrustworthy because they could not possibly be objective on tobacco issues. And to make matters worse, these three men were scientific contributors and editors to two of the most influential reports the Surgeon General released in recent tobacco control history. Benowitz and Henningfield were the scientific editors on the first report, Nicotine Addiction, published in 1988. This report is responsible for the claim that nicotine is more addictive than heroin and cocaine, and it was very beneficial to the pharmaceutical companies who at that time were first launching their NRT products. Consider that psychological strategy, though. If you make smokers believe that they are addicted to nicotine, that they are addicts, then they'll have a much harder time quitting cold turkey. The only logical conclusion is they must use these NRT nicotine replacement therapy products in order to quit. Because if smokers are addicts with a disease, then that means big pharmaceuticals needs to create a drug to treat them. The aforementioned nicotine addiction report has been heavily, heavily criticized and heavily, heavily debated. Most recently, critics saying that they don't believe that the human animal can become addicted to nicotine without smoking cigarettes. And the second report had the help of Samet and Benowitz. The 2006 Surgeon General report on secondhand smoke said that secondhand smoke kills people and that there is no safe level. This report, along with claims from Stanton Glantz, who also contributed to it, heavily influenced the beginning of smoking bans in the Western world and caused a huge spike in sales for big pharmaceutical and their NRT products. And this wasn't Samet's first attempt at these claims either. In 1992, he was the scientific editor of an EPA report, which was the first report to call secondhand smoke carcinogenic. However, in 1995, a congressional independent research group questioned the validity of this report. And in 19 in 1998, it was invalidated by a federal district court judge in North Carolina, effectively calling it junk science. In fact, the most recent science shows that the dangers of secondhand smoke are much smaller than we were led to believe, and that worldwide smoking bans have done very little to impact public health, regardless of the fact that both of these reports offer weak scientific evidence to support them, and have since been widely disputed. These these three guys, Samet, Benowitz, and Henningfield, were able to invent the worldwide belief that secondhand smoke kills and that nicotine is as addictive as heroin or cocaine. And after all of that, you might be wondering, well, why are these arguments still around today and still being spread around as fact? Unfortunately, the sad truth is that those initial reports made global headlines. And when research came in later that contradicted that, people just weren't interested. And we are going to end this 510 report today with a quote from the writer Jonathan Swift. Falsehood flies and truth comes limping in after, so that when men come to be undeceived, it is too late. The jest is over and the tale hath had its effect. And believe it or not, even after all of that, we're still kind of just getting started with the big pharma story here. But really, this is where we're going to wrap up this episode of the 510 Report. The continuation of this will be next week on next Wednesday, where we're going to wrap all of this up in a nice little bow of corruption. Of course, we can't end the 510 Report without first mentioning CASA.org. It's free and easy to sign up. All you need is an email if you want to know about possible negative vape legislation happening in your particular state, city, area. Join CASA. They let you know all about that stuff 
follow the calls to actions. One last huge thank you to Danielle Jones. And as Kevin Skipper always used to say, you don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Let's get involved. (laughs) 